a pleasure to be here. Um, I've spent the past few years working in the Caribbean, working in various monitoring programs, and in particular thinking about the linkages between terrestrial runoff and coral reefs. And obviously many of those reefs have been impacted by climate change. So I thought I'd highlight some of the key findings from our monitoring and survey programs and then give you a bit of an overview of what I'm hoping to do with Malcolm whilst I'm in Australia. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a brief introduction to those threats that I've been working on recently. I'm gonna give you my perspective of a reef, so that of carbon at budgets and the different processes we think about. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about terrestrial runoff, what it means for coral reefs, what it means for reef growth and reef destruction. And then a little bit about some of the climate change effects we've been seeing in the Caribbean. So what's happened post bleaching and then that will lead me on to my work in Australia. Okay, so the main areas I'm gonna talk about today include the Caribbean, so Jamaica and Tobago. And Jamaica's the third largest island in the Caribbean, and Tobago has some of the southernmost reefs in the Caribbean. And it's also somewhat unusual because it also experiences runoff from the Orinoco and the Amazon River, two of the largest rivers in the world. And then I'm going to talk at the very end about Australia and the GBA, GBR and land-based runoff. So threats and disturbances. Well, as I'm sure you're all aware, aware, a lot of what we do on the land ends up in the near shore coastal zone. And this can come in the form of river runoff, sewage runoff, storm impacts, and other pollution sources. And this enters the near shore zone and affects our water quality and consequently the reefs that live there. And this can affect sediment levels, turbidity, light penetration, and eutrophication. These images are from the Buku Reef Marine Park in Tobago, and some of the things we've been seeing associated with deteriorating water quality include expanding seagrass beds, coral disease, algal overgrowth, and zoanthid overgrowth. Um, also, we've all been seeing increased occurrence of bleaching events, and this has been linked with thermal stress, and I'll talk a little bit about this. And to put this into context for you, the majority of studies in the Caribbean and probably in the GBR have tended to focus on normal clear water reefs. Turbid water reefs can also be phenomenally productive, and they occur in many of our near shore zones but they're quite different reef systems in that they're exposed to pulses often of turbid water. This can have fluctuating salinities from brackish to marine. It can be nutrient impacted and obviously there's turgenous input. So a lot of land-based sediment flowing in. We know a phenomenal amount about clear water reefs, but we still don't know so much about these turbid water reefs. So I've been thinking about how do these different reef building processes interact? How, what are their roles in turbid water reefs, and what does this mean for the net rates of reef accretion, reef building? When, we look, when I think about a reef, I typically break it down into those organisms that produce calcium carbonate and those organisms that take away calcium carbonate from the reef. So you're all aware we have our big reef builders, which are your scleractinian corals, and these guys put down the main kind of building blocks on a reef, but then we have smaller organisms that most people normally don't think about. So your encrusting organisms, so your bryozoans, your crustose coralline algae, your circulars, and your forams. And these guys basically cement, infill, and stabilize the reef framework, and they're actually a very important component. The flip side for the reef builders are those that actually remove calcium carbonate from the reef substrates. So you're all used to looking at fish populations, urchin populations, and these guys chomp away at the reef from the outside, eroding it down. But there's also those invisible organisms that most of us probably don't see when we swim on a reef. And these guys actually eat the reef from the inside out. So we have the very small microborers that we use SEM to look at, and these include algae, bacteria, and fungi. And then we have the slightly larger internal bioroders. Such, your, such as your bioroding sponges, your worms, and your bivalves. And when you piece together this picture, it gives you an idea of how rapidly the reef is accreting. And of course, for any reef to survive into the future, we also need successful coral recruitment. So I've been thinking about all these different processes and how does terrestrial runoff, climate change, bleaching, and disease affect how all these processes interact. <coughs> 
Okay, just to give you a quick cap, a lot of this work has been done in conjunction with a huge range of collaborators and colleagues. It's combined in situ experiments, manipulative experiments, and we've started to use some novel geochemical analyses. So this is a huge collective set of data. So to give you a quick recap, when I think about a carbonate budget, I'm basically quantifying rates of calcium carbonate growth and production, deducting from that rates of carbonate loss from the system, and trying to assess how rapidly the framework is accreting. So my first study site is in Jamaica. Jamaican reefs are near shore fringing reefs, so they're in close proximity to the shoreline, making them increasingly vulnerable to land-based runoff. Um, I chose the Rio Bueno embayment because it's a small embayment. It's characterized by a river coming in in the southern portion, so we have turbid water reefs here and clear water reefs here. Jamaican reefs are overfished and they have very few urchins, just to set the context. And these are the two sites I'll be focusing on. We did quite a lot of habitat mapping and compared the two sites, and one of the things we found were that these reef communities, and this is depth down the side, were quite different. Turbid water reefs were characterized by a lot more coral growth in the shallow water zones, up to 43% hard coral cover, which for Jamaica is pretty impressive. They were composed of very different species and very different morphologies, with the clear water reefs having a preference for platy species, and the turbid water reefs having more resilient dome-shaped species. What was interesting was when we actually calculated rates of calcification, we found that the turbid water reefs were actually calcifying slightly quicker than the clear water reefs in Jamaica. And um, this is in terms of primary coral production, which hopefully I'll explain a little later. We also looked at those secondary calcifiers, so those encrusting organisms that bind the reef framework together and stabilize it. And again, there were some interesting differences between clear and turbid water sites. They had very different species communities. And again, those turbid water sites had a lot less secondary calcification and reef binding. We then decided to look and quantify, or try and quantify, those bioeroding processes, so those that remove the calcium carbonate. And just to give you a quick look, this is a piece of rubble that broke off during a storm. And as you can see, there's a lot of internal bioerosion going on. And this is probably the reason this particular piece snapped off during the storm. We looked at macroborers and we looked at microborers, and what we discovered were that clear water sites actually had significantly more macroboring, whereas in turbid water sites, those very small microboring processes actually proved to be the more important destructive force. We also looked at rates of urchin bioerosion, and in Jamaica in 1983 and the wider Caribbean region, an urchin pathogen pretty much wiped out most of the diadema urchins. And at the time of the study, there were still very low numbers of urchins. And they'd actually preferentially come back to the clear water sites. And this is reflected in our rates of urchin bioerosion. We had very low levels of urchin bioerosion. And the majority was at those clear water sites. We also quantified rates of fish bioerosion by using a series of surveys. And again, what we found was that turbid water sites, the diversity and biomass of reef fish was very much reduced, and we had less small-bodied juvenile and herbivorous fish species. Using feeding study information and kind of substrate turnover information, again, we were able to estimate rates of bioerosion, and again, that reflected what we were getting at turbid water and clear water sites, and we had more fish bioerosion occurring at clear water sites, and that's a direct link to biomass studies. So when we put this into one big carbonate budget model, what does this tell us? Well, corals are the primary framework producers and the primary calcifiers on the reef. But interestingly, internal bioerosion on the Jamaican system was more important than external bioerosion by fish and urchins. This was a secondary importance, primarily because the reefs were overfished and we don't have very many urchins. But from my perspective, the good news is these reefs are still accreting, albeit slowly. So I'm quite happy with that news. Jamaican reefs do still have some hope. And just to highlight the differences between the 1970s and now, we saw shifts in the key calcifying species and their morphologies. 
We saw a reduction in coral calcification, reductions in secondary and cluster calcification, reductions in external bioerosion by fish and urchins, and increased macroboring. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any microboring data to compare this to. And then this leads me to Tobago. I moved to Tobago in the wake of the Caribbean 2005 bleaching event and worked with a fantastic NGO called the Buku Reef Trust, and we initiated an island-wide monitoring program. And one of the things we wanted to do was assess the after effects of the coral bleaching event. So what we did was we assessed these corals. Now, initially, post-2005, it looked like these corals were recovering, but what we discovered about a year later was many of these corals subsequently became diseased with Caribbean yellow band disease and then black band disease, so they almost got a double whammy, a succession of coral diseases. We also wanted to know what happened with coral recruitment. So we measured hundreds and hundreds of coral colonies, and then using growth modeling, we were able to backtrack to the year of recruitment. And what we basically found was the majority of those framework builders had not recruited to the reefs in years following major bleaching, hurricane, or tropical storm events. And that was really quite clear. And this leads me to what I hope to be doing here now in the Great Barrier Reef. We've taken coral cores from the central GBR inshore to offshore using parietes, and we've done the same in Tobago near the Orinoco and the Amazon River. And we're hoping to use these coral cores basically to look at past events on the reef. These guys are stationary, they're long-lived, they provide us with regular records and high-frequency results. And um, using geochemical analysis and trace elements, they give us really lovely proxies for temperature, sediment runoff, and other variables. So we're hoping to do some historical reconstruction using these geochemical proxies, looking at terrestrial runoff and hopefully shifts in catchment land use. And we're also hoping to see how these changes have affected reef calcification and obviously I'm interested in the difference between clear water and turbid water reefs. Thank you. <laughs>